All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our sixth edition BCBA task list series. We are continuing concepts and principles with examples of stimulus control. Now, stimulus control is incredibly important because everything we do with behavior, we're often trying to establish stimulus control or remove it. When we talk about SDs or discriminative stimuli, we are talking about stimulus control. We want to reliably evoke behavior in the presence of our chosen discriminative stimuli. And through reinforcement or no reinforcement, we can start to establish stimulus control over behavior with these antecedent stimuli. Now, while that sounds complicated and on the surface, it is a little complicated, but we're going to try to make it as simple as possible, as always, to help you on your exam and in practice. So please, if you haven't already, subscribe for all of our video updates. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard, let's get going. So stimulus control refers to situations in which the presence or absence of a stimulus reliably influences the occurrence of a behavior. So it's actually, when we think about it that way, not that difficult, right? If there's an antecedent stimulus present and it evokes a response reliably, we can say, well, there's probably stimulus control. If there's an antecedent stimulus and no response, then this stimulus probably doesn't have stimulus control. We're just looking at when there's antecedent stimuli in the environment, what is happening as a result for our learner? What kind of behaviors are they engaging in? Think about when you show up to your session, how does the client react? Are they happy? Are they excited? Are they on their best behavior? Well, then you have stimulus control over those behaviors. If they're reacting in other ways, if they're running away or not being compliant, well, then stimulus control is over those behaviors and we need to change it to where stimulus control is over the behaviors we want to see. So simply put, behaviors occur more frequently in the presence of a specific stimulus we can also affect things like latency and duration, or behaviors occur less frequently or not at all in the absence of that stimulus. So when we talk about stimulus control, we are looking at behavior that is consistently reinforced in the presence of an antecedent stimulus or not reinforced in the presence of an antecedent stimulus. In other words, we have our SD, which evokes our behavior. And if we want to start to establish stimulus control, we need to deliver some sort of reinforcement for that behavior. Because now when that SD, that stimulus is present, that is going to signal to the learner that reinforcement is available. If we have an SD and it produces a behavior and our consequence is punishment or extinction or no reinforcement, well, next time that stimulus is present, the antecedent stimulus, it's not going to signal reinforcement is available and this behavior is less likely to occur. So again, we're looking at the antecedent stimulus for what has stimulus control, but we're creating stimulus control through the use of reinforcement. And we're reinforcing behaviors in the presence of stimuli we want to have control. So it occurs through repeated reinforcement of behavior in the presence of a specific stimulus, the discriminative stimulus or SD. Behavior is unlikely to occur in the absence of the SD, the stimulus delta. Now, back to our example, this SD is going to become the SD with stimulus control because we're reliably reinforcing. This SD is going to become the stimulus delta because it's not reliably producing reinforcement. So now this behavior is going to occur more reliably in the presence of the SD that leads to reinforcement compared to the S delta now, which doesn't lead to reinforcement. Think about that very slowly, right? Don't rush through that concept. This is such a critical, critical concept. If you can grasp this, then you really, really start to understand how we change behavior. This SD produces reinforcement. It becomes the SD with stimulus control. This S delta does not produce reinforcement. There is now no stimulus control. So for example, a student raises their hand to answer questions only when the teacher is present. So that teacher has stimulus control over raising hand behavior to answer questions. It's unlikely the student is going to raise their hand to answer questions in the presence of their friends, right? 
because that's not going to produce reinforcement. The teacher has a history of giving reinforcement to the student for raising their hand, which has now given stimulus control to the teacher's presence and the behavior of hand raising. So effective stimulus control depends on clearly established and consistently reinforced relationships between stimuli and behaviors. The key here is consistent. We've got to be consistent with what we are reinforcing and what we are not. And those antecedent stimuli are so important. We have to identify in what, in the presence of what antecedent stimuli do I want to deliver reinforcement? That's how we're going to create these relationships between the stimuli and the behaviors. We can influence frequency, latency, duration, amplitude, magnitude. We can change all these characteristics if we establish stimulus control, right? We can make it happen more often. We can make it happen maybe for a longer duration of time. The intensity, the amplitude can change. All these characteristics can change in the presence of some sort of antecedent stimulus that has or doesn't have stimulus control. Stimulus control allows us to reliably predict behavior. If you know that you can present a stimulus that is going to reliably evoke a behavior, then you can make the decision on how you're going to reinforce or punish that behavior, right? If you know that saying a certain phrase is going to cause a certain behavior to your client, well, if you want that behavior to keep happening, you'll produce reinforcement. If you want that behavior to stop, then you may produce punishment or extinction. So understanding what does and doesn't have stimulus control is super important. Once you understand on a really deep level, stimulus control and what antecedent stimulus or antecedent stimuli are going to evoke what behaviors, you can pretty much predict your entire day with your client, right? I've had clients where we understand stimulus control so well, we can predict almost everything the client's going to do in response to what we do. And when you get to that point, now you can really start using our consequences to change behavior. So back to our teacher example, the teacher reinforces hand raising behavior consistently. So the teacher is present, the student raises hand and they get reinforcement. And so now the teacher becomes that stimulus, that discriminative stimulus, they have stimulus control because they're only calling on the student when their hand is raised. Reinforcement history strengthens stimulus control, increasing the likelihood the student will continue raising their hand when the teacher is present. So that's a good point to make here is that the longer the reinforcement history, the stronger the stimulus control. And so typically the harder it, it is to reverse stimulus control. So keep that in mind with your clients when you're trying to maybe undo stimulus control through extinction or whatever it means is the longer their learning history, the harder it's going to be. So key takeaways, stimulus control is often established through differential reinforcement, right? We're either reinforcing or we're not. We're gonna reinforce behaviors in the presence of an antecedent stimulus to create control. So our antecedent stimulus, we have our behavior, we deliver our reinforcement and we're creating stimulus control for our stimulus. Behavior reliably occurs in the presence of a specific antecedent stimuli when stimulus control is present, and it helps reduce unwanted behaviors by altering environmental cues. How do we do that? Well, we know that if we know what certain stimuli produce behavior, if we can, evolve, if we can alter the environment and do some antecedent interventions, then we can change the behavior before it even occurs. I know that's a ton. Stimulus control is incredibly important. And I, like I said, if you understand how it works and the idea behind what antecedent stimuli are controlling what behaviors, you're really going to improve as a behavior analyst because then you can start to predict and really plan instead of just going in and constantly having to reassess, right? If we understand the environment on a level of, we know what stimuli is going to produce what behavior when, we can really start to effectively deliver consequences. So review this until you understand it, right? I think it's one of the first really kind of challenging ideas we have at this point in the task list, because as an RBT, we don't really talk about stimulus control on this level, but keep at it, keep working at it, watch this video as many times as you need until you really understand it. Other than that, please subscribe. It helps us. You get all of our video updates. Please do it if you haven't already. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard, 
See you soon.